sure that uh, this class is, is more fun, so to say. Before, before I even start, um, maybe just a very tiny bit of my background so you understand where I'm coming from and where I see this. I think um, Buprita made it very clear at the outset, um, comparative law in transnational business law, that's a, a very complex project topic. And I'd like to emphasize on, on something she said um, early on. She said, it's a topic which can be approached from different angles, different perspectives. And um, I will speak about this later on, but I would like to highlight to you in particular how I see it and where I'm coming from. So I'm telling you this because you should keep in mind that what I emphasize and, and my main focus is just one way of uh, several ways um, to see it. It does not um, necessarily mean it's, it's uh, the best way, but there is no best way. It really just depends on where you're coming from and what approach you take. So I am, just one moment, I need to turn on my fan. Um, I am an international lawyer in the sense that um, the work I do mainly relates to laws that are not just of one jurisdiction. That's my own definition of international lawyer. But um, as much as I am um, trained and admitted to practice in, in Austria, a civil law country, um, I have spent the majority of my career outside of Austria including doing work which was um, not only had nothing to do with Austrian law, but often involved um, common law areas. Um, because most of my career, I have been working in the field of, and, and still am, um, international dispute resolution with a heavy focus on arbitration. And uh, very often the substantive law to contracts and also very often the seat of arbitration, I'll, I'll maybe um, briefly mention on these topics later on, they were um, common law, um, from common law jurisdiction, be it English law, be it US law, be it uh, Singaporean law, be it Malaysian law. So, um, and, and another topic, and I will briefly highlight on that later on, because I think it's also part of being an international lawyer, um, being involved in transnational law. Sometimes even when the applicable law is um, that of a civil law country, if the people who decide the arbitral tribunal, if they are from a common law country, it means you need to start engaging in comparative law at, at a low level, but, but still you have to do it to some extent. And if all of this doesn't mean much to you, don't worry, I will um, explain uh, what I mean and, and where I'm coming from. I just want you to keep uh, these in mind when you, when you hear me speak. Um, because as I said, there are different ways to look at comparative law in, in transnational law. And uh, where I'm mainly coming from is really the practical side. But before I go there, um, let me please start with the basics and uh, share my screen. And I kindly request the, the host uh, to allow me to share my screen. Okay, let because me, right now I cannot give you the access to the co-host in order to you can share your screen. Okay, it works yes, now. Okay, Thanks. great. Thank you. Okay. So we speak about um, comparative law 
in transnational business law today. But I really want to start with the basics to make sure we are all speaking about the same thing and to make sure you are all about, you are all on the same page. So I'm asking you, um, what is comparative law? Does, does anyone um, have an, an idea or any comment? And uh, please keep in mind that I don't give any, any grades <laughs> for, for, for bad answers. If anything, um, you know, when you answer, it's going to be positive. Okay, all students, please give your perspective on what is comparative law. And uh, in order to make this lecture more uh, interactive, Harald, uh, this is your uh, old student is given opportunities to give uh, their thought and this, uh, 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 to, 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 to interact with uh, Harald. Okay, the student, this is a time for you to, to give uh, the question on the question raised by the Harald. Okay. Karen, I, yeah. I, um, Theron Thalita, you raised your hand, please. Um, comparative law, in my opinion, is a study regarding maybe the differences and the similarities between like two laws from different countries or more. Okay, that's, that's great. That's already a, a very, very good answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is your, sorry, is your, how should I address you? Is it uh, Farron or is it uh, Talita? Or is it both? Fair, Mr. Sepo. Okay, Farron. Thank you, Farron. Anyone else? Okay, then let me, let me just move on. Um, and what Farron said is very close to the, textbook definition of, of the textbook you're using for this course. It's the systematic study of the institutions and rules of at least two different legal systems on a comparative basis. So I think what uh, Ferran mentioned is very, very close. Um, in particular, uh, what she thankfully pointed out is that it can involve more than two legal systems. Um, that's important because sometimes we only focus on country A versus country B. Um, so let's briefly speak about this definition. It's the systematic study. So if we really stick to the textbook definition, you know, if, if I just ask you, um, I don't know, uh, what, uh, what's the worst punishment you can get for um, bringing drugs into Indonesia? And you give me the answer and I say, oh, and, and I understand in Indonesia, it's the, the death penalty in, in the most severe cases. And then I can say, oh, and in Austria, in my country, um, at worst, you will go to jail for um, 10 years, if I'm not mistaken then we have compared you know, the rules of two different legal systems, but it's not really systematic. So usually it's something that's a bit more intense than just a um, you know, really tiny thing. Um, it's institutions and rules. So I want you to keep this in mind because the example that I mentioned, it only regarded rules, right? The, the criminal law consequences of um, smuggling drugs um, on the one side in Austria, on the other side in Indonesia. Institutions would also involve, for instance, which courts get to decide um, in a country versus um, another or several other countries. It would involve um, how, how is the appeals process? Can you go, for instance, all the way to the Supreme Court when you appeal? Um, or do you have to you know, stick with lower courts? It's also questions like this. 
Um, institutions, however, also involves um, organizations aside from the court. It can be institutions such as who makes the law. You know, is it is it a parliament, or is it like we have in some countries? Um, let's think about China, for instance, where um, we had an important uh, political decision taken just now, recently. There is no real parliament, right? But still you have a body which makes rules. So these would also be institutions. We could also be comparing um, the branch of a country which is in charge of um, enforcement you know, the, the government, um, which um, authority does it have, which um, agencies does it rely upon, et cetera. So it can be really broad. And um, usually when we think about comparative law, we only think about comparing the rules, but keep in mind that um, the rules can only function when the institutions are in place. And therefore, it's important to remember that uh, comparing the institutions can also be very important. As I said, it's two or more legal systems. If you only speak about your own legal system, or if um, you determine which law should apply based on the conflict of law rules, I'll briefly highlight that later then it's not comparative law. And finally, there should be a comparison, right? If you just speak about system A and system B, but you don't really compare, then there is no comparison. It's, it's just stating A and stating B. So this is the textbook definition of um, the book you are using. But as I said, it um, it is just one definition. Other people may have another perspective, um, which may be slightly different, but at broad, this is what it is. And importantly for this lecture, this is the definition that I will be using. Any questions so far, please raise your hand. But I don't see any hand here going up, so I'll move on. My next question is, what is not comparative law? And we can say, well, it's everything that's not this one, but maybe that's um, not really helpful, right? So let me highlight that. What is not comparative law is merely applying one foreign or one legal system. For instance, I mentioned before that I predominantly work as an arbitration lawyer and arbitrator. Now, if I work in that capacity and the applicable law is Singaporean law, just as an example, I only apply one legal system and there is no comparison at all. It's just I do everything that I would do in my own national law, except that it's now foreign law. This is not comparative law. This may be called international practice from, from your own perspective, but um, it doesn't make it comparative law. It could also be the case when your client, let's assume you're a lawyer, requests you to review the draft of a contract and that contract is subject to English law. Let's say um, your client knows that um, you're also an expert on English law, which is maybe not a good example because you are still students at, uh, at an Indonesian university, but uh, who knows, maybe in the future you will be going to, to the UK to do your LLM and you will gain considerable knowledge on, on English law also. So if the client comes to you and asks you to do that, that's not uh, comparative law because you're only reviewing the contract based on English law. 
I mentioned this example that um, you may be involved in an arbitration and the laws of a foreign country apply. And finally, um, if we speak about courts, the court determines on the basic of conflict of law rules that the laws of Japan apply. And there may be numerous other examples, but I think what you can see here is most importantly, when we speak about comparative law, it is not only applying one law or, or one uh, foreign law. So next time you meet a, a lawyer who claims to do comparative law and uh, you ask that lawyer why that is and he or, or she explains to you that um, there is often a foreign law element, then you can second guess um, the allegation that this person is really doing transnational, sorry, comparative law. It's, it, you may call it transnational, although that is doubtful, but it's not comparative because it's just one field. Now, I mentioned the conflict of law rules several times, um, this part here. Could I, could I ask everyone to raise his or her hand if you know what this means? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So could you kindly raise your hand if you if you know what uh, conflict of law rules are? Okay, I, I see one hand only. Nicholas, would you thank you so much for raising your hand. Um, would you mind uh, briefly explaining what that is? Because apparently you are the only one who I don't know, dares raise his hand or or the only one who knows? Well, I wouldn't say that I know it better than anyone, just in my opinion. Um, conflict of law is a quote-unquote dispute or different in, well, I'll say different in interest on whether which law should apply because uh, the different background shared by the parties. Great. Um, thank you so much, Nicholas. Why can I ask you? Sorry, you, you already lowered your hand, but <laughs> can I ask you just as a follow up question? Why, why do we end up in a situation where it is not entirely clear which laws apply or which law should apply? I think. Um the easiest way uh, of that kind of dispute can happen is because the different background of the parties, first of all, or maybe because uh, they don't have a meeting on mind, meeting in mind on which law should they apply to certain uh, substance of the contract or another thing. Okay. What do you mean by different background? Well, for instance, okay. I see Farron raised her hand, so maybe Farron can answer it. <laughs> oh, you can go first, and then I'll um, try to explain a bit in my opinion. Well, different background, in my opinion, is, for instance, um, you're from Austria, I'm from Indonesia. Okay. Then we conclude a contract. Um, uh -huh. However, uh, we, we, of course, share a legal system. Despite we're both uh, civil law countries, again, in practice, it's different. Many regulations are different. And um, therefore, there will be some sort of uh, conflict of interest because I don't really know the Austrian law and you don't really, I assume if that you really don't know the nation law in detail. So as a parties, uh, we both want a law that we are familiar with rather than uh, applying a foreign law that we are not really familiar. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Nicholas. And, and no more questions to you for now. <laughs> you are you can relax no thank you so much i think what you meant by different background is uh the geographical background if you want to say so uh, one one party is from country a one party is from country b Feren. i truly agree with what nicholas has 
uh, explained before, but I just want to add that a conflict of laws usually uh, arises arise due to uh, maybe unclear definition or unclear explanation on which law that the parties want to apply in case of maybe in this case transnational business law as the transnational contract itself. So that's why the conflict of law uh, arises and then the court has to determine which law should apply to the contract itself. Yes, very good. Thank you very much um, to both of you, Nicholas and, and Ferran. Um, just to, to emphasize and, and again, uh, clarify some of the points that have been made. Imagine that um, all of you who, who I understand are based in Indonesia, make a contract with me. Like each of you makes a contract with me. And um, I'm, I'm selling you my mobile phone. And uh, in the contract, we determine um, the price and we specify the mobile phone and uh, we specify that I should you know, ship it to, to Indonesia so that you get it. And that's it. Now, imagine that you receive my phone um, and it has a defect. And uh, you come to me and you want your money back. But I say, no, 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 it had no defect when I sent it. So eventually there is a dispute. And you see that I'm not giving you my money back, your money back, even though the phone does not work at all. And you will obviously be very unhappy about it. And um, you want to have recourse to, to the courts um, to get your money back. But which courts should you go to? Should you go to Indonesian courts? Should you go to Austrian courts? Because I'm based in, uh, because I'm an Austrian citizen and uh, or, or maybe should you go to Malaysian courts because I'm a resident here? This is the jurisdictional question that that's one part. But even once you have determined which court has jurisdiction, and let's say in our agreement, we also said that any disputes must be resolved before the Jakarta District Court. Let's let's just assume that. Even if you have done that, what substantive law applies to our dispute. Now, it's clear that the Jakarta District Court will apply the um, Indonesian procedural, the Indonesian rules of civil procedure. I think that's 100% clear. But what's gonna happen to the substantive law that is to be applied by the court? This is not clear because we did not agree on it. Now, in this case, um, countries generally have a contract, conflict of law act. In some civil law countries, it's also called private international law act, as opposed to public international law, which is the, the law between states. And this is the law between individuals. And in this um, private international law act or conflict of laws act, there will typically be a rule that says the law shall apply where performance took place. It's just an example. And uh, this way courts or also arbitral tribunals or any other body which needs to decide uh, can determine which law applies. So my question to you is now, have you ever dealt with comparative law? Is there anyone who, who has done that? And I don't see any hand um, and maybe none of you has, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Let me give you some examples. You may have participated in an international moot court competition. Perhaps before you. Yes. Sorry, who? 
I, I, I did not know who was speaking. Okay. Uh, maybe you have... Uh, sorry, Harald. Yes. Okay. Uh, Harald, okay. Uh, before moving on to this, to this question, uh, please allow me to, to, to ask you a little bit uh, confirmation about uh, comparative law itself. As you know, in Indonesia, uh, particularly, we uh, try to uh, differentiate between the conflict of law and private international law. This is the two subjects that is some, uh, sometimes is interchangeable. Uh, in your opinion, uh, Harald, uh, do you think that uh, private international law and the, the conflict of law is similar? Or if not, uh, can you explain it more? Because our students sometimes get, get confused on, 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 on this uh, terminology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Pat Morsal. But just, just to be on the, on the same page, are you differentiating between private international law and conflict of law or public international law and, and conflict of law? Because the way I use these terms, and you know, again, this may be one example um, where <laughs> legal background may play an important role, uh, but uh, the, the way I use these terms is that private international law and conflict of law are at large very similar. So I want to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah, or else, uh, I think in, in, in Indonesia uh, as well, uh, most of the legal scholar um, said that law is similar, but uh, Sometimes there's also a different uh, point of view on, 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 on that, but I just want to make sure that uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, theoretically, uh, both a subject is similar, but uh, in some Indonesia lit lit uh, lit literature, there, uh, there are some uh, uh, different point of view, but I totally agree with you. Uh, and I think, uh, Conflict of law and private law must be considered to be a similar subject. Thank you, uh, Harald. Sorry. No, no problem at all. Um, so I was speaking about you, possibly uh, you, obviously the students, um, having dealt with um, comparative law, and uh, no one raised his or her hand, but you may have been involved in international moot court competitions. Um, I think, was it, Nicholas, was it not you that uh, you posted on LinkedIn that just today that you are, am I, am I mixing your name? No, that was you, right? I did participate in uh, international moot court competition, but I didn't pass it today. I see, but okay, it doesn't matter, but uh, thank you. My, my point here is when you participate in, a, in an international moot court competition, you know, be it uh, the VIS moot you have heard about or the, the FDI moot or Jessup, I'm, those of you who are interested, I'm sure you have heard about those competitions. Now, then you use court decisions from various countries. You also use uh, decisions from arbitral tribunals around the world and possibly legislation. Arguably, when you do that, you are dealing with comparative law because you are using all that, studying it systematically. It's more than one jurisdiction. And then based on everything together, you make an argument. This, of course, only works in a moot court competition because um, you know, in, in, in real life, you cannot use uh, Rule from a rule from this country and a rule from that country and so on and so forth. But that's not the point here. My point is that as much as this may seem like a very abstract topic, you know, something that um, only scholars engage in or, or maybe international lawyers, um, it's something that you have already, may have already been dealing with. And if you um, participate in a moot court competition in the future, 
maybe something that you will be dealing with going forward. You may have also been studying the laws of another country in comparison to Indonesian law. So this is another field where you may have been um, doing internet, uh, sorry, comparative law. I don't know about you, it depends on each person. But again, I just want to highlight as much as it sounds like something very abstract at a, at a very high artificial level, that's not the case. Again, just to remind you and to make sure we are all on the same page, what is not um, comparative law or what would not be comparative law is when you do an LLM in the US or in the Netherlands and you study the national law of that country because there is no comparison, right? You are just studying um, this field. It's also not the case when you do a moot court competition that is under Chinese law only, um, because again, this is just one law. I think it's obvious to you when I say doing a moot court competition under Indonesian law, it would not occur to you that uh, this could be comparative law because it's um, the laws of your own country. But also um, when it's a foreign law, when there is no comparison, please keep in mind that this is not a uh, comparative law. It really requires this comparative element. Now, let me put comparative law in comparison, which sounds odd, comparative law in comparison um, with other laws. But again, to make sure we are all on the same page and we use the right terminology here. There is public international law. This is basically the law, I already mentioned that before, that deals with the relationships between state one and uh, state two, or it can be one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, on the one hand, and also between states and international organizations. When I say international organizations, do not think of international companies like um, Coca-Cola, for instance, or, or Apple, but rather think of um, international organizations like the United Nations or like um, the European Union. This is what I mean by international um, organizations. So the sources of public international law, or at least some of them, to, to make sure we're all on the same page. This is treaties, international customs, general principles of law, and court decisions by international courts, like the International uh, Criminal Court, for instance. Um, it's also decisions by arbitral institutions dealing with public international law. You may be aware that um, I'm just thinking of an example now where there was uh, a well-known decision by, by an arbitral tribunal in the field of public international law. You may be aware that um, China has several conflicts with other states in um, East Asia as regards the borders. And I'm not speaking about uh, Taiwan here. I'm speaking about um, also um, the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc. So China will often, as you may have heard, claim that a certain island belongs to China or a certain zone of the sea belongs to China. And other countries will say, no, that's not true. It belongs to us. And um, I think this is now already almost uh, 10 years ago. There was once an arbitration between the Philippines on the one hand and China on the other hand about um, it. And it was a territorial dispute. This is also part of public international law because it regards two states, not two individuals. 
There is private international law that I that I mentioned before, which deals with um, jurisdiction, foreign judgments, choice of law, etc. And uh, you will see that as much as I agree that a differentiation can be made, and maybe if we are precise, should be made. Um, I took the liberty, uh, for, for the scope of this lecture to make it very simple, um, you know, not to confuse anyone. And therefore, um, I've basically used the, both terms in, in the same way. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> and then there is comparative law. So which law is comparative law? We have um, the above that belongs to public international law and to private international law, but what is left for comparative law? Does anyone have any idea? If you have no idea, that's good <laughs> because there is no law as such <laughs> that can be said is comparative law. Because when you think about the definition that I mentioned before, and I'm not going back on all my slides, but you may recall it was the systematic comparison between institutions and rules. So it must always be two things, right? Because you cannot compare just one thing. There must be two things. And it's, it's funny in a way, we speak of comparative law, but we can never say this is comparative law. We can say we are engaging in a comparison we are saying we are comparing two things or, or three things or even a hundred things, but we cannot say this is comparative law. When you think about my definition, it said a systematic study of, it did not say a field of law, right? So this is very, very important. And this is what I want you to keep in mind that when we, compare the term comparative law to other terms that, you know, sort of are international, like public international law or public private law, then really it's, it's quite different because there are rules which are part of public international law or, or decisions, et cetera, the ones you see on the screen. The same applies for private international law but we cannot say that for comparative law. Comparative law is more the, the action or um, the process itself, if we want to say so. In fact, there are people who say the term comparative law is um, very misleading and, and is a, a term which should not be used because it, it gives this impression uh, that you say, oh, um, this is part of uh, comparative law, and, and this is part of uh, public international law, and uh, this one here is uh, private international law. But you cannot say that. It's, there is nothing, uh, you know, public, comparative law has no, no uh, nothing that, that is in itself comparative law. It's always the process. And uh, maybe you can, you could say at, at the most, following the comparison that the outcome is comparative law, but it, it would sound odd and it, it would not uh, be entirely correct. Any questions on, on this point? Okay, then let me move on and Let's um, again stay at the very basic levels here. Oh, so, yes. Right, a question from Keanu. Yeah, Keanu, Keanu has a question, please. 
Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm just uh, I'm trying to understand what trying uh, to say about the the uh, comparative law. Uh, what I get is from is are you saying that comparative law is actually a process to a resolution or something? Because I still don't understand until now what is comparative law. <laughs> Thank you. It, uh... Keanu, it shows that um, maybe I should have explained better. Um, the point I'm making here is when we speak about certain fields, um, when I ask you what is criminal law, then you will say, well, it is the, the rules um, and institutions that deal with um, crimes, you know, a, a very basic definition. Um, and I'm not a criminal lawyer, so it, it may not be the best definition, but I think at large, we are on the same page. When I say you, what is um, civil law? You will um, say it's the rules that deal with the private um, relationships between citizens. When I say what is company law, you will say it's the rules that govern the functioning of companies, et cetera. And um, Adiana, I saw your hand. I'll, I'll get to you in a minute. I'll just finish this. <laughs> now, this is all domestic law, right? Because criminal, we can say there is criminal law in Indonesia. We can say civil law in Indonesia. We can say company law in Indonesia. Comparative law is always the comparison about two things and usually it's at an international level in the sense that at least for this scope here because we're speaking about comparative law in transnational law right so it would typically be country a versus country b and maybe a few other countries right so there is an international element so to highlight this further i highlighted that when we speak about public international law we have several um, elements for which we can say that is clearly public international law. For instance, a treaty. If Indonesia signs a free trade agreement with Australia, as was the case a few years ago, that's an international treaty. It's between the country Indonesia and the country Australia. So this is clearly public international law. We can also say that um, private international law clearly deals with um, certain aspects that can be defined, such as in the example I used before, you have a contract with me, but we did not agree what law shall be applicable to um, our contract. Now, if there is a dispute and we ask a court to decide, that court will determine which law must be applicable. This is part of private international law. So we also know, or we can define to a certain extent, what is private international law. But when it comes to comparative law, you cannot say A, B, C, D is comparative international law. That's not possible. It's not possible because there is no such thing that is comparative law, as in, you know, this law is comparative law. You can maybe say this law is the result of having compared several laws and then found the best rules from each country and then having come up with a law of its own. But um, it's still going to be either domestic law or international law. Comparative law as such as a as a field is is not there. It is a process. So it's always the the process itself when you engage in it. This is uh, comparative law. Uh, Keanu, I, I see you not. So I hope this is clear now. If not, uh, feel free to to come back uh, later on. And now, um, Adiana, is that how I pronounce your name? Yes, yeah. is that is correct. 
Yes. Well, I have uh, just a little confirmation about this comparative law. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that uh, comparative law is not a part of branch of law? For, for, for instance, like uh, criminal law, private law, corporate law, bankruptcy law, and etc. And comparative law is more that like a method that uh, the lawyer use or maybe scholar use for the process in comparing within different jurisdiction of, or between different system of law. Is that correct? If we use your definition of branch of law, then yes, it's correct. Um, the reason I'm saying if we use your definition, now there are some, especially scholars out there who engage in comparative law. And if you are telling them what you do is not a branch of law, they will be very upset. They will say, of course, that's a branch of law. But if we use branch of law the way you used it, um, then it's 100% correct. It's more the process rather than, you know, you, you take a book um, and it lists the most hundred um, important rules in civil law, right? That, that would not exist for comparative law. And, you know, when I, what I mean by the most uh, hundred important rules, um, I'm sure all of you, if you have done civil law, all of you know the, the principle pacta sunt savanda contracts must be adhered to. You, you know that, right? This is arguably the most important rule in, in private law or in civil law. Um, but you cannot say the most important rule in comparative law. If, if anything, it would relate to a process. Um, for instance, it would be when comparing the laws of two countries, um, try to see both laws um, without your own uh, background, you know, try to see them openly. That that would be a rule, but it relates to the process and is not a substantive legal rule. Okay, great. Thank you very much um, to Keanu and Adiana for for asking questions. You know, I I have now been a lawyer for about uh, fifteen years, and. Um, to me, many things are normal and, and obvious. And also, of course, I'm the one who prepared the, the slides for this lecture. So it's normal that, um, to me, some things are, are just normal and, and I don't even have to think about them. But, um, you know, when I go too fast or when something is not clear, please uh, reach out at any time because I, I want you to learn something and um, you know not, not to sit there wondering uh, what on earth uh, this strange guy from Austria is doing here. So what are we comparing? We already spoke about some items, but I want to um, make it clear that, uh, you know, or, or I want to do it in a more systematic way. Remember that uh, comparative law is the systematic study. That's what um, I said in the definition. So I want to be systematic in my lecture also to make sure we are all on the same page. Now, first of all, we can say we compare legal systems as a whole. I already mentioned this to some extent. I already said a country is a civil law country and there are common law countries and there are Islamic law countries. And further um, definitions exist, but I'm just um, you know, keeping it at a, at a very um, high level here. So we could, for instance, say English law, sorry, Indonesian law, that's civil law versus English law, that's um, common law versus Arabic law. Sorry, by Arabic, I mean Saudi Arabian law. Arabic is, is not the, the right expression here, but I mean Saudi Arabian law, which is uh, an Islamic uh, law country. So we could compare these as a whole. You know, at, at a very high level, um, we, we would see um, a lot of uh, differences. For instance, the most important um, difference here 
is um, that, that I'm sure um, you, at least some of you are aware of. In um, Indonesia, which is uh, predominantly civil law, um, there is no precedent, meaning that courts, or correct me if I'm wrong, but at least that's the rule in civil law countries, courts are not obliged to follow what higher courts said before. On average, they do. So if the Supreme Court of Indonesia says, um, you know, when A, it should always be B, then usually the courts follow that decision, but they are not obliged to do so. Whereas in the common law world, there is something called um, precedent, or some also call it stare decisis. I'm simplifying those terms a bit, but in principle, it's, it means the moment a higher court has decided on a certain issue, unless the facts are significantly different, any lower court has to decide in the same way. That court can no longer say, well, you know, I don't, I don't care what the higher court said. I think that's wrong. That's not possible. So um, if in the UK, the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court even, once they decide on a certain issue, all lower courts must follow that decision. Same thing in Malaysia, for instance, where I'm uh, practicing. So this would be comparison of legal systems as a whole. We can also compare areas of law. For instance, what are the objectives in criminal law in Indonesia in comparison with Austria? Now, I don't know if you did criminal law, um, but typically when, at least in, in Austria, when I studied criminal law, um, I think it was in the first lecture that the professor raised the question, what is the objective of criminal law? And most of us said retribution. In other words, you know, the, the person who commits the crime, the offender, needs to be punished. And that sounds very obvious, right? That we would all think that this is the main goal of um, criminal law. But there are other goals as well, other objectives. There is deterrence, you know. If um, the punishment in Indonesia for smuggling drugs or for even taking drugs is so high, you would assume, I, I don't know any statistics, but I assume that um, there are a lot fewer drug addicts than in other countries because Many people are so scared of taking drugs, they don't even want to start with it. And if you don't start with it, you, you can never get addicted. But there is also something that um, I have no idea about criminal law in Indonesia, but you may have heard of, namely rehabilitation. This is, for instance, the predominant goal of several countries in Europe. The predominant goal of um, predominant objective in criminal law is to make sure that those who commit a crime can be reintroduced to the society. And you may be surprised that, especially in the Scandinavian countries in Europe, um, you know, in Sweden, Norway, Denmark. Um, there are some prisons, I, I call them prisons, where the incarcerated people um, are not like prisoners, but they are to some extent almost like, like guests because um, they can move around freely, they work and earn money, they can study, and uh, they only have to go to their cells at night to sleep. 
because um, the main goal for this prison, it doesn't really deserve the name, I should say for this uh, rehabilitation institution, is not to punish anyone, it's not to deter anyone, but it's to make sure that those who have committed a crime are given a chance to be reintroduced into the society so that once they can go back fully, they don't commit another crime. So I'm only mentioning this because we could say the objective in country A is this and the objective in country B is this. So that's an area of law, criminal law. This is what we could also compare. We could also compare specific rules of law or specific provisions. For instance, what are the rules on psychological injury in Indonesia in comparison with EU countries? If, for instance, um, I have a car accident because, um, let's, let's say there is a, a lamp standing on the side of the street and uh, the city government doesn't maintain it well and the lamp falls down and it hits my car while I'm driving. And let us just assume for the, for the sake of the example that um, I am unharmed physically, you know, not a single scratch, but um, ever since this happened, I have um, suffered from psychological harm. I'm in therapy now because I cannot live you know, my, my normal life anymore because I have a psychological injury. Now, I have no idea about Indonesia, but in Austria, the principle is that when that happens, any psychological injury, as long as it has been shown by a medical expert, is treated the same way as a bodily harm. In other words, it does not matter if the, the scratch is, you know, on the outside of your head or on the inside of your head. You, you get um, damages either way. But you can see here that um, I'm, I'm starting at the very top, you know, legal systems as a whole, that's as broad as it can get. Then I have areas of law, and then I have specific rules. Um, so in theory, we can compare anything. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, completely up to us. And it uh, depends entirely on us what we are comparing. Any questions on, on this? And please don't ask me about criminal law in, in the EU because I'm really not an expert. <laughs> <laughs> No, but any, any questions on, on uh, what we are comparing? Okay, great. Again, what I want you to keep in mind is um, that on the one hand, um, on the one hand, comparative law, you cannot say it's A, B, C, D, E. It's the process, right? So that seemingly makes it um, quite limited. In reality, however, since we can really compare everything and anything from, from the, the most important parts, you know, from institutions, so to say, sorry, constitutions or even legal systems, all the way down to a very tiny specific rule, comparative law can be everything at the same time because there are no limits to comparison. Now, you may ask yourself, who is comparing? When we speak about those comparisons, there must be people who do them. And um, who is doing that, right? So I classified this into three main categories, but um, I think at large, this is, again, really my classification, so others may see those things differently. But when we speak about legal systems as a whole, that is 
typically is callers only because hardly anyone else um, than scholars, you know, who really have the dedication and make the effort to study everything. Um, really to them, it matters at a very high level, whether the country is um, a common law system or a civil law system or an Islamic system. You know, you, you would not find for instance, anyone in government who says, oh, um, I'm wondering, should, should, we, should we change from a civil law system to a common law system? Um, no one does that because it would be way too complicated to change all that. So when we ask the question, who is comparing in this area, it's really um, scholars. But again, I hope you heard what I said, I said, Scholars have the dedication and make the effort to do that. So I'm definitely not downplaying it. This is very important as it helps in an overall understanding. I'm just saying the interest is usually only with scholars. We then have areas of law. Now, again, just to make sure we're on the same page by areas of law, I meant, for instance, what is the objective of criminal law or um, what is company law like in country A versus country B? Here, we also have scholars because again, scholars do everything. <laughs> they are the only ones who can do everything. We have courts and tribunals and also lawmakers. And let me briefly explain what I mean by, by the letter to um, stakeholders. Now, in... Oh, sorry. No, I'll, I'll do that on my next slide. <laughs> that will be easier. Um, for now, I just want you to, to keep that in mind. When it comes to specific rules, the third area, I also include lawyers here. And there are always exceptions, you know, no one says it can only be done by scholars or it can only be done by you know whoever but on average this is really who is comparing let me briefly highlight what i mean now legal systems i said this is typically scholars so i copied here an article that i found on the internet um, that deals with legal systems, the common law and civil law traditions. Now, I don't know who wrote that article, and it doesn't matter to me, because even if it was a lawyer, I mean, someone who is traditionally not a scholar, the moment the lawyer writes an article like this, which is just comparing legal systems, that lawyer acts like a scholar right, in the way that the lawyer does it for the sake of scientific research out of um, curiosity, etc. This is not there to give specific advice to someone or to warn someone, etc. This is really just for the sake of research, which again, as I said, um, I'm when I say just for the sake, I'm not downplaying it. It is very important but I'm, I'm limiting now to the, to the activity that um, only scholars engage in. When we speak about areas of law, I want to highlight um, a few examples. And when you recall areas of law, we had here scholars, lawmakers, and courts and tribunals. So for scholars, what, what could it be? What is one possible um, activity here? It could be a publication comparing court intervention um, in, you know, whatever. I thought of arbitration when I did that in country A versus country B versus country C. Um, just to very briefly explain court intervention in arbitration, because I mentioned that. Um, traditionally, when two parties decide to go to arbitration, 
Um, they have an agreement on jurisdiction, and it means that courts are not allowed to intervene except for what is provided so under the applicable law. So sometimes um, I'll give you an example. You, you may have, um, in, arbitration is a private process, right? And uh, sometimes you may want to examine a witness, but that witness simply doesn't show up. Now, if that witness does not show up in a court, I, I don't know about the rules in Indonesia, but I very much assume that the Indonesian court could ask the police to bring uh, that witness before the court, right? When the court wants to question a witness, the court, uh, sorry, the witness has to show up. It has to appear. Now, an arbitral tribunal cannot, you know, call the police and say, please help me. I mean, an, arbitra an arbitral tribunal can do that, but the police is not going to do anything um, because tribunals do not have such power. So in this case, an arbitral tribunal would have to reach out to a court and asking it for assistance. This would be an area of court intervention. And a scholar could compare that, you know, what it's like in country A, what it's like in country B, what it's like in country C. When we speak about lawmakers, who, what do I mean by that? That's a bit of a colloquial term. Um, by lawmaker, I mean all those people who are involved in the process of making new laws, the legislative branch of of a country, which is typically the parliament. Now, when we enact a new law, let's take a new law from Indonesia, the personal data protection law. I think it's just about a month old or so. I mean, th that's when it entered into force, if I'm not mistaken. Now, what does this have to do with the comparison? I was not involved in the personal data protection law in Indonesia in any way, but I am 100% convinced, you know, without having been involved myself, that those in Indonesia who were involved in the process were looking at the laws of several other countries to understand how the law on personal data protection is made in those countries. And um, I would assume and, and hope that they took some rules from here, some rules from there, and some rules from there, and combined what they thought were the best rules for Indonesia, which may be different from the best rules for Malaysia or the best rules for Austria or any other country. It doesn't matter. But what's important here is that typically in the process of making laws, the people involved will compare the laws of several countries. So they have some, some guidance, if you want to say so. There is also, um, this is not really lawmakers, but I still want to highlight it at this point. You may have heard of the UNCITRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. That's a part of uh, the UN. And they make so-called model laws or model rules, which in the eyes of the people who make those model laws, are the best rules that a country should adopt with respect to a certain field. For instance, the UNCITRAL model law on arbitration. Um, in this case, the people who came up with the model law compared the best rules in the world, arguably, because for the UN, it's a, it's a really huge process and then came up with something together. So this is what I mean here by lawmakers. Although of course, again, the, the people at UNCITRAL, they are not lawmakers in the traditional sense, just to make sure 
we're all on the same page. When it comes to courts and tribunals, let us assume that there is a very complex question on Indonesian civil law. I don't want to give any example because I know little about Indonesian civil law, um, only a few rules, but let's assume that arises. And it's clear from the um, Indonesian Civil Law Act. It's also, sorry, it's unclear from the Indonesian Civil Law Act and there is also no court decision. So what should a court do in this case? How can they find what is the best way to decide? Does anyone have any guess? What would be one approach? It's not an easy question, I admit that, <laughs> but I wanted to see. Well, if, if I were a judge in Indonesia, I would possibly, and I have to be careful here because I'm, I'm not qualified to practice in Indonesia, but I'm just using common sense here. I would remember that the kita undang undang hukum perdata, sorry for the pronunciation, um, that it derives from Dutch law. Right. And traditionally, as far as I understand, the Dutch simply imposed uh, their own code um, back then when they um, when they took possession, so to say, of, of Indonesia. Now, possibly one way to resolve such a question could be to look at um, Dutch court decisions if they exist. And that would again be comparing laws, if you want to say so. And um, what I also already mentioned to some extent, um, but I mentioned it for the lawmakers, is to get guidance from model laws. Now, I can tell you that um, when you read judgments on arbitration matters in Indonesia, the federal court, which is the Supreme Court of, of Malaysia, sorry, I wanted to say when you read judgments by the federal court in Malaysia, then the, the federal court here, um, our Supreme Court, it very often makes reference to the ancestral model law. And it says the scope of this law or the, the overall goal of the ancestral model law was blah, blah, blah. Malaysia changed its arbitration act in 2005 because it um, adopted the ancestral model law. So this specific or this broadly speaking, this should be always interpreted having in mind this scope and this goal. I think that that makes sense. But um, any questions, please let me know. But I don't see any hands going up, so I'll move on. Um, as I think I've, I've already taken almost uh, one hour and a half. Um, who is comparing specific provisions? You know, Keep in mind, my example was a specific provision of what, what do the rules say on damages for psychological injury. For scholars, again, I think it's clear by now, lawmakers, it's usually not the case because lawmakers do not deal with only one specific provision, but usually with laws in general. But it may be, so it's a, it's a larger picture if you want to say so, but it may be that there is a new area of law where you do not need an act of its own, but just an update of the law. Let me give you an example. Um, 
the countries, um, the, the civil codes of some countries needed to be updated to make sure that um, there is liability when robots or, or machines, you know, cause damages. Because before the entire concept was that only the humans themselves can cause damages. Now, if, if it's a human driving, then that's clear because that's a car. But if it's a robot, you know, that is working completely independently, for instance, make it uh, one of those cars that um, drive on their own and there isn't even anyone sitting inside the car. You know, if the rules of your country only say that a person can be liable for his or her own actions and the car is driving on its own, then there could at least be some argument that um, there is no liability for a self-driving car. It, it always depends, and I don't want to go into detail here, but I wish to highlight to you that there may be a very specific area. So you don't require you know, the act on, on robot liability. Uh, that would go too far, but it would still be helpful to at least have um, an update on your law to make sure that there is some liability. When it comes to courts and tribunals, and we speak about um, specific provisions, we again can take guidance from model laws or from laws upon which our own laws are based. That's the same thing. And here, sorry, I should, I should go back and highlight um, when it comes to areas of law, here I emphasize the overall scope and goal of something. Here, it's about a specific provision only, which however may also provide guidance. And um, courts or tribunals may then say, well, in our own country, there is no decision yet but how did another country, which had the same situation, how did they interpret it? How did the court of another country do that? When it comes to lawyers, and here I'm, I'm mainly speaking about uh, my own experience and what I also do, is to some extent, uh, as the courts above, because I need to show to the courts why they should decide this way and not that way. And um, when it's a new field and there is no uh, decision in the country where I'm based in, you can be sure that um, I will try to find a country where a decision is in favor of my client. Um, because in that sense, I don't act as a scholar who is um, objective and, and trying to find what really happens. I'm just there to represent my client and, and get the best outcome for my client. So it's, it's different in a way, the approach. And also what I want to highlight to you, because this is an area in which you may well engage in after graduation, um, you may translate local laws to a foreign company. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me, let me briefly speak about um, work as a, as a lawyer. Sometimes it's necessary to determine the arbitration agreement, sorry, the law applicable to the arbitration agreement. I, I will not get into details here because we don't have enough time, but I want to highlight that in principle, there are two approaches. Some people say it's the law of the seat of the arbitration and others say it's the law of the contract. When I say some people, I should rather say some courts. The courts of some countries say it's this, of some the courts of some countries say it's that. Now, if there is no decision in the country um, where the issue is before a court or an arbitral tribunal, then what you would do as a lawyer 
would be to advocate in a certain direction. Or maybe what you do, and I'm now speaking about um, translating um, the law, you would maybe write a client um, alert or, or guidance for your client. And I just want to highlight um, something that um, I wrote and uh, that will be sent to several of my clients next week. There was a decision by the French uh, Cour de Cassation, the, the Supreme Court, about a month ago, and it decided this way, and the UK Supreme Court decided that way. And my article here, uh, my client note, is an advisory note to the client where I explain what they should do in order not to be in that situation. But the point here, why it is comparative law, arguably, is I write here lessons from the French and UK apex courts, the, the highest courts. So I'm mentioning this because it is an example of a lawyer doing comparative law, in this case, myself. And I wanted to highlight to you that um, what it is like when I say I do comparative law in my own practice. When it comes to explaining local laws, um, keep in mind that you may, for instance, at some point have a client from a foreign country and that client says, look, I want to have a subsidiary in Indonesia and then I want to run a factory there. But can you tell me what are my obligations when it comes to the employment rights? This is something that um, I did recently because there was an update in Malaysia. Now, if you only explain what happens in Indonesia, that's not comparative law. But if you have the background from the EU or another jurisdiction, for instance, and you then explain to your client, look, I know in the EU is like this. In comparison, we do it like this in um, Indonesia. And I wrote Malaysia because um, I'm not doing it for Indonesia. I'm doing it for Malaysia. Then you are engaging in, in comparative law. So again, I'm, I'm highlighting this to you because I want you to be aware that um, comparative law is not something that's really abstract, that, that you never deal with. I think you can deal with it um, quite often and, and uh, more easily than, than you think. Another example of uh, what I did recently is um, a battle of forms. Does, does any one of you know what battle of forms is? Can you raise your hand if you do? Yes, Nicholas. Um, maybe to my knowledge, I think the easiest example is about contract. For instance, in civil law, to my knowledge, there's no form requirement. However, in a common law country, uh, there's a thing called a statute of fraud that have to be signed to a certain um, to a certain value of land or something. Or maybe, for example, another example is an arbitration agreement. As in Indonesia, um, under the arbitration law, uh, the arbitration agreement must be in written. However, what about in other countries? We have to compare first. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're raising a very good point, and you could be right, <laughs> but uh, battle of forms usually refers to something else. It um, and don't ask me why it's called forms and and not uh, battle of terms, um, because it refers to the terms and conditions. So imagine a situation. I'm again. Um, selling you my, my mobile phone. And in my, in my um, offer to you, 
I say um, my terms and conditions, you know, which are listed here, they shall apply to this contract. Now, if you accept the contract, there is no problem, right? My terms and conditions will apply. But what if your acceptance says, I accept your offer and my own terms and conditions, this one here shall apply. And then I send you the phone and you pay. What happens in Indonesia if that's the case? Have you, have you ever studied that? Have you come across that? I don't see any hands or, or um, <laughs> anyone speaking up. Um, let me tell you, this is in, in real life, this is a very, very common um, situation because what happens very often is that um, contracts are agreed upon or are made not in a separate document, you know, where you state uh, these are the parties, these are the obligations, um, etc., and at the end they sign. That's that's more the exception than the rule. Of course, these contracts exist, and they are very common. But what's much more common is that a company will simply say send a purchase order to another company. And the purchase order will say, um, you know, I'm purchasing 100 items of your of your mobile phones, um, and uh, my own terms and conditions apply. And then the seller will send back an order confirmation, and the order confirmation says, I hereby acknowledge uh, receipt of your order. We agree to sell uh, 100 um, mobile phones our general conditions on sale apply. This is the typical process um, when it comes to companies doing business. Keep in mind that um, it may be frustrating to you, but keep in mind that uh, lawyers usually just hinder the process of doing business because uh, we have all the requirements and all that. Um, but it's not necessary really to have a written contract to do business. You know, every time you go to a restaurant, you don't have a written contract. It's it's still uh, valid, and and you would not uh, make any fuss about payment, right? And that's the same here. So this issue arises very often. Now, what happens in civil law countries is typically the knockout rule, which says, um, I have. Um, my set of conditions here and your set here, we compare them. If there is anything that um, is the same, we keep it. And if anything is not the same, for instance, your contract says Indonesian law applies. My contract says, or sorry, not my contract. My terms say Austrian law applies. Your terms say Indonesian law applies. In that case, um, it, it's not compatible, right? So it would be knocked out. Um, that's the approach civil law countries take. Common law countries, or rather courts, common law courts, take the approach of the last shot rule. So whoever sends his um, or says last, my own terms and conditions apply, those terms actually apply. So I was recently explaining this to a European client because the EU is almost exclusively civil law while, um, while Malaysia is common law. So I explained to the client, I said, look, in Europe, we do it this way, but this is Malaysia, so they do it this way here. So in doing so, I was again comparing two laws and thereby engaging in the practice of uh, comparative law, if you want to say so. 
There is also contract drafting. What I have learned in my last 15 years of practice or in my 15 years of practice, not the last, it's only been about 15 years, is that it's very good to combine the best practices from two countries or two systems. I believe that um, common law contracts are often you know, too long. They, they provide for everything and anything, which I believe is unnecessary. But um, what I think, for instance, is very useful and uh, civil law contracts often do not have it is to have a preamble where you explain why the parties enter into this contract. Why does it exist in the first place? What is the goal of the contract? What do the parties have in mind? I like it because when you do that, already when negotiating the contract, you can make sure that everyone is exactly on the same page. And uh, trust me, more often than not, uh, parties are not on the same page. It may sound crazy to you, but uh, reality is that often there is a, a different understanding. And then you are drafting the contract and, and negotiating it. And suddenly the other side, I'm, I'm speaking now, you know, that I'm getting involved uh, for a client to, to draft a contract. And then the client sends it to the, to the other company and then they say, oh, I, I wasn't clear that um, this one part was so important to you. I thought uh, you only wanted us to, to build the machine, but I can read from the preamble that uh, training is also very important to you. So this is why, um, th that's a small example, but I wanted to highlight it because um, it's an example that shows where, um, you know, combining the best of two worlds, comparing what, how do they do it here? How do they do it there? Um, can be very useful in practice. Um, Pak Murasal, I noticed that it's now already 1 p.m. <laughs> I think uh, uh, we still have uh, five more minutes for the presentation. Uh, After that, we can go through the Q&A session. Okay. Okay. Then I... Uh, yeah, then I continue. Thank you. But um, sorry, before before we before I continue, any questions on on what I highlighted here? Um, any? I don't know. Do, does it make sense what I wrote on the slides uh, and what I explained? Um, did you think it was different? Um, does it sound very boring or interesting? Any any comments from anyone? Okay, then I move on. What do we need to keep in mind when we are comparing? Um, and I want to highlight here, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to legal systems, remember that was sort of the, the first category um, I was comparing. I said it's legal systems as a whole, it's um, areas of law and then specific rules. You know, the, the big thing, the middle ground, and then a very small thing. For legal systems, a traditional way to compare is civil law versus common law. And I already heard one of you, I, I forgot who it was, but um, one of you said Indonesia is a civil law country. And when we look at this um, traditional differentiation, um, you can in fact see that um, the world can at a very high level be divided into a common law world, a civil law world and a, a mixed world, if you want to say so. And um, this is not my own map. I took it from someone. And um, to be honest with you, I 
don't even agree with it 100% <laughs> because I would classify um, the Philippines, you know, which, which is here as a mix itself, but that doesn't matter. That's just, I'm just mentioning it. Now, when we compare these uh, systems, I have a few questions now um, to you. And, and those are much easier than, than other questions I've, I've asked so far. So I hope for many answers. You may have paid attention and you saw that uh, North America is, I'm speaking about Canada and the US now, is um, entirely common law, except for two parts. Does anyone have any idea which parts these are and, and why they are mixed? I'm asking this because I believe it helps your understanding of legal systems. I'm not doing a, a test here. <laughs> okay. No one dares. Let me tell you that um, the huge orange part here in Canada is called uh, Quebec. You may have heard about that. And they speak French there, yeah. not English. Does this help you? Does anyone have any idea now? Why is it a mixture of civil law and common law? and not purely common law like the rest of Canada. Okay, one more hint. The part down here, the small part of the US is called uh, Louisiana. And uh, you may know the term or the name Louis from history because many French kings were named Louis. One of them was uh, beheaded by the guillotine in the French Revolution. And uh, you may know Louisiana because of the Mardi Gras festival, which, and Mardi Gras is also a French term. Any idea now? Okay. I thought I was giving a lot of great hints, but maybe not. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> for that. Um, let me tell you, the systems we have, not, not just um, in America, but pretty much all around the world, all have to do with history. It's as simple as that. So, as you may recall from history, the English, the British Empire, once um, owned um, what is now the United States before there was uh, the American Revolution. But um, they weren't the only ones who were there. Part of it in the South was Spanish, at least for some time. And part of it down here, this small thing, Louisiana is named after a French king, Louis. I, I forgot which one, it doesn't matter, but it used to be French. And this is why they still have some elements of civil law, which are in French. Quebec up here, we have the same story. It used to be French. And, and when I say French, I don't refer to the language now, I refer um, to, the, to the part of the country to which it belonged or the part of the world to which it belonged. It, it was a French colony. And uh, when the English won the war against the French, they um, took over uh, Quebec also, but um, they left the French civil law as it was because that was the law that the local population, 
by a local population, here I mean settlers from France who had emigrated to North America, had been dealing with all the while. And uh, those settlers were very happy to have English criminal law because French criminal law was much, much stricter. So having a less strict criminal law was great to them. Um, but the civil law, the, the English just left it as it was. And um, I know this by coincidence because I spent one year of high school um, in, in Quebec. So I learned this in history class. <laughs> What about Southeast Asia and, and South Asia? You may note that um, we have India here and uh, Bangladesh and Nepal and Bhutan. They are common law. Um, we also have, well, that's not shown here anymore, but down here we have, um, we have uh, Malaysia which is common law. And of course, Indonesia, which is civil law. Why do you think, um, why do you think India and Bangladesh are common law countries? Um, because uh, they have an influence from England, if I'm not mistaken, from the history themselves. Yes, what influence was that? Did they have uh, good diplomatic relationships? Or what was it? It was the colonization. Yes, exactly. Thank you. They were colonies. And um, as is often the case in, in, uh, in history, when uh, colonization came, the, the people who were colonizing uh, those countries, they brought their own laws. I mentioned before that um, in Indonesia, the civil code is based on, on Dutch law, to my understanding, and that's for the same reason. But then we have some exceptions, um, which is already written here on the screen. What about China, Japan, and Korea? Now, I don't know how, how interested you are in history, but I can tell you that China, Japan, and Korea have never been colonies. They were never colonized. But um, still, they all are civil law countries. Why, why is that? Does anyone have any idea? I can tell you, and, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end at this slide um, because there's no need to show the slide for that. Um, some countries um, tried to modernize uh, their entire systems and, and still are trying to modernize. And uh, when it comes to Japan, China, and Korea, it all goes back to Japan. You may recall from history that in the late uh, 19th century or from the late 19th century onwards, Japan was really modernizing um, itself in, in many, many ways. And uh, Japan determined back then that the German uh, law system that was in place in Germany then was the best. Now, I don't know if they were right or wrong. It, it doesn't matter. That's just what they did. They adopted the German civil code and uh, they are the ones who later brought it to Korea and to China. This is why some countries, even though they are not um, civil law, sorry, even though they were never colonized or, or you know, had no relationship, um, they adopted that. This is also what happened in many parts of Europe where there were no colonies. Um, it was the Europeans who were the bad guys, you know, who went to the rest of the world and, and just took possession and committed um, a lot of cruelties. Um, but in Europe, um, there are two major um, influences. 
One is uh, French law, which is from the Napoleonic code. And the other one is uh, German law, which is from the German code of, of civil law. With that, I think I spoke for a very long time. <laughs> no worries. Two hours. Well. <laughs> yep. And mm -hmm. I, I thank everyone for the participation and, and uh, attention. And I hand back to, to you, Pak uh, Murasar. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Harald, for such a comprehensive overview on comparative law. It's quite informative for our students to give them better understanding uh, how uh, comparative uh, law uh, plays important uh, roles in the era of globalization and also in the uh, transnational business transactions. And now uh, we move to the Q&A sessions. At least uh, there are here uh, 15 students and now we give you opportunity to ask the question directly to the uh, simple by raising your hands now your turn uh, Marcel, uh, okay before yeah, Javid, uh address uh, his question if i may give uh, some uh, response from the herald stations Sure, Bupita, please. Yes, uh, Harold, it's really so interesting to follow your uh, lecture because maybe just to add some context for all the students, some of the students here is uh, starting to write a uh, vinyl assignment. For example, Adiana, uh, because Adiana is under my supervision. So, uh, for example, in terms of the implementations of the investor state dispute settlement or in the practice of the arbitration law, I think uh, the comparative law becomes something important that we should possible or we should uh, consider to put as one of the method of research. So, um, my questions and might be to add some context with uh, this uh, sessions is sometimes uh, we confusing to um, understand what is the comparative law, what is the comparative method, and what is the comparative approach. Something that we can uh, use in a one times in terms of the method of research. And since I think um, in, the, in your lecture, uh, uh, you mentioned that scholars have some, um, some opportunity or who, who is uh, doing a comparative is a scholars. Thus we can also put uh, like uh, the research assistants or like students because uh, most of the students from the transnational business law department in the uh, final assignment, and also we also encourage them to publish their final assignments in the journal. We also uh, and and uh, they often um, research on the topic that uh, Indonesia still are need and regulations need a models or from a benchmark or comparative from the other uh, state practices or from the other systems of law then maybe uh, you have um, suggestions on how we use the comparative law or comparative method uh, in the kind of the research when we have, uh, we need to uh, produce uh, the result from the research such uh, like uh, the model of regulations or the uh, concept of law. So, I think uh, that's really important. So, and the student can get the, the, the point from this lecture that uh, I think in the transnational business law, which is, we understand this is very dynamics and Indonesia is one of the developing countries that uh, currently has so many interactions with the other state from the various system of law. So I think comparative law is something that we could not avoid it so we have to face, we have to face, and we have to we have to deal with uh, any every time when we face with the uh, potential legal problems. So Harold, maybe you have some suggestion for the students, and also.
Javid, uh, you can uh, address your questions. Thank you, Harold. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bulpita. I, you know, to clarify, when I said scholars, I'm I'm really including everyone who engages in the work of scholars. Um, I would not call myself a scholar, um, but I published some articles um, where I was comparing uh, legal systems in East Asia, and which are traditionally um, civil law, but then have received a lot of common law influences. And arguably, when I did that, I was engaging in the work of a scholar. Um, so I think it's fantastic that uh, students can can write their own assignment and and thereby become um, junior scholars, if, if I may say so, um, themselves. By by doing that, I think the takeaway will be much greater in comparison than uh, simply listening to a lecture or um, or, you know, uh, I don't know, reading a textbook. Um, if you do something on your own and actively engage in it, you will usually learn um, a lot more. Um, I think uh, there's nothing to add uh, really on, on the importance because um, this should be clear to everyone. Um, you are now, you will be dealing with foreign laws um, if you work for a law firm um, almost on a daily basis in one way or another. And um, there is, yeah, I, I cannot emphasize this more. It's, it's truly important that you um, deal with foreign laws and then um, are open also. And, and not only in, in my lecture next week, I will speak about methods. Um, and also what, what I um, consider truly important when working in an area here. Um, so I don't want to take away too much from that, but uh, one point I'd like to emphasize now is we are always trained in usually one system. Like you are trained in, in Indonesia, I am trained in Austria. So when we are dealing with a foreign law, we often tend to see everything with our own, um, in my way, in my sense, sorry, in my case, uh, Austrian eyes in your sense, or in your case, Indonesian eyes. Um, that is normal, but at the same time, um, when engaging in comparative law, or, or even when only um, reviewing a foreign law, it's of utmost importance to forget everything that's in our heads that we know from our own national law and really try to understand the foreign law um, as it is and not you know, having everything in the back of our head because it, it, it is like uh, when someone says to you, um, oh, that's a really beautiful picture. Don't you think so? Then you are inclined to saying, yes, yes, I agree. And you're already influenced. Um, and when you do that, you do not fully grasp uh, all particularities and all subtleties of the foreign law. That, that's just not possible. And I don't know if it is possible to ever forget what's in the back of our head because how we generally see things is a matter of our experiences and our memories but uh, the goal should still be um, to do that. So I want to emphasize this um, at this point already. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Harold, for responding to the uh, question. And now we move to the Javid. Javid, uh, could you please uh, to press your question to the Harold? Uh, firstly, am I audible? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harold, I 
apologize firstly because I am not that active during your discussion in the presentation. And to answer your question, yes, your presentation is uh, very good and very excellent and it was easy, easily to uh, understand. But uh, my question is not wholly on the comparative uh, law context, but what I want to know is actually in the legal practices or in the international uh, pract uh, legal practice, when you have a conflict during uh, some kind of comparative law, but it's not actually a comparative law, uh, it was kind of a contract law when uh, one parties are uh, forbidden to do something in their uh, uh, with their uh, regulation that regulates them. Uh, there are a contradiction with uh, the other party. Uh, is there any some kind of resolution so that these parties could make a contract or they can work together or uh, the end is no, they, they cannot because there are uh, a contradiction between uh, the law that regulates them. Uh, maybe that's for my question. Thank you, Mr. Harrell. Um, thank you, Javid. Could, could you could you be more specific um, so that I know what specifically you have in mind? I have some ideas, but I'm not sure I'm on the same page as you are. Uh, okay. Well, uh, for maybe a, in the case of international trade, when uh, in some uh, developing country they tried to uh, hold their uh, resources uh, so uh, it cannot be used on international trade while it, the other countries uh, they they uh, they wanted to make trades with these countries maybe that that's uh, for some cases but it would be excellent if you just give uh, in the general context or other sure are you are you thinking about uh, Indonesia banning palm oil from being exported or coal or or tin? <laughs> um, this is what I what this was one of the things I was thinking of. Um, now, in principle, when you apply the rules of a certain country in a contract, the laws of that contract will apply, right? Because if so, in other words, if you agree that the laws of um, Malaysia shall apply to a contract between an Indonesian and a Australian company, then the laws of Australia shall apply. But this does not mean that you can disregard um, all other laws. There are some laws that are always um, binding and we don't have to think as far as um about you know something that's uh that's now very specific with uh, the indonesian government having taken um protectionist measures several times this year because in in early january it was about coal then it was palm oil and i think now it's uh tin if i if i recall correctly um, think of a situation where I'm an Austrian company, I come to um, Indonesia, and um, we agree, and sorry, and you are my contractor, you are a construction company, and you will build a factory for me. And we agree that the contract is done under Austrian law. That could be a normal situation because you know I pay, so I want Austrian law and you agree. Now, just because Austrian law applies, it does not mean that um, you can do so, or it does not mean that it will apply to everything you do. For instance, your workers, you know, on the construction site, they will still be governed by Indonesian law even though they are involved in this project, which is governed by Austrian law. So maybe Austria is a bad example because the, the labor standards in Austria are quite high. But let's say I'm from a very, very underdeveloped African country and same situation. Now, I could say to you, um, 
in the laws of my country, you know, employees must work for 120 hours every week. Sorry, it's a stupid example, but I'm just, you know, putting it this way to make it very extreme. And our contract is governed under this law. So that's what must happen to your employees. Um, this, of course, would be a silly argument because it doesn't work this way. Uh, labor law is, is one area where um, it will always be the, the local laws um, that apply. And um, there are numerous other fields where um, this would be the case, even when the contract is silent. Now, these days, most contracts will, will uh, have a provision, especially on this labor law issue, they will typically also have a provision on uh, mandatory laws of, of that country. So it's, it's not at dispute, but even if you forget it, you know, forget to include it in, into your detailed contract, um, there is a general principle in, in most laws. I have no idea about Indonesian law, but it exists in most laws that no one can be compelled, no one can be forced to do something that's against the law. And uh, the same principle would also apply here. So um, in the case of, um, of the restrictions of, of export, that same principle would apply. However, it's more complicated than that. And um, I'll not go into all details here, but uh, the principle that you cannot be forced to do something that's against the law, that I'm, I'm quite certain that applies in Indonesia also. Thank you, Mr. Harold. Anyone else? There is no other question, Harald, and it's been two hours, and it's uh, I think uh, it's quite comprehensive uh, overview today on the uh, comparative law, and I myself uh, think that there are so many uh, uh, insights that you've been uh, given today, and it's quite helpful for me to to me and to our student to understand. Uh, comparative law uh, in general and in specific way. Uh, unfortunately, we come to end to uh, this, this session. Um, Thank you once again, Harald. Uh, we do really hope that you will be able to give uh, another lecture to our students. Uh, hopefully, in next Friday, uh, to this Friday, we will have another uh, lecture series. Uh, well, Finally, uh, I as moderator to the lecture today want to say uh, thank sorry, you. Sorry, Pamursal, to interrupt. <laughs> Just no, to uh, if uh, so, uh, the students will uh, will meet again with Harold uh, maybe next week. So Harold uh, is really looking forward. If you have something to read or as a reading assignment for the student before your lecture, it would be. Uh, very happy to to learn and then hopefully that in the next sessions uh, the student would be more interactive and I think it's really important to have a session with you that's uh, my additional uh, from me uh, more so. thank you very much Harold totally agree with you Bupita uh, Harold hopefully our student will uh, get previous reading and after that uh, when we conduct a lecture they will be more interactive like we did today and uh, finally uh, we do really hope that uh, this session will be uh, good uh, uh, understanding for our student and look forward to seeing you in another lecture that is held by transnational business law see you everyone in next session thank you Thank you very much. Have a good Thank day. Thank you, Harold. Have a nice day. Thank you, Thank you. everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you.